Every now and then, I meet someone who's changing the world for the better by their sheer will alone. Whether they're authors, activists, or adventurous, these people are blazing a path with their deep enthusiasm and allowing the world to follow. Their passion is strong, and my passion is to tell their stories. I am Brian Platt, and this is Passion Project. So I'm here with Craig Shawley of African Wildlife Foundation. He's the vice president. Welcome, Craig. Thanks very much. Happy to be with you. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm um, really uh, happy for you to take the time out for this. Um, you know, you're, uh, you've had a really long and storied and, frankly, very inspirational um, career in conservation. Uh, has that always been the case? Have you always been involved in conservation? Well, first, thanks very much for the compliment. And, and yeah, my entire career has been devoted to, to conservation in one way, shape, or form. I, I can't remember a time when I was not interested in wildlife and conservation. Even as a kid, it was my, uh, my general focus. Um, I trained as a biologist and, and then ultimately had the good fortune to, to go to Africa in, in uh, my early 20s uh, as a Peace Corps volunteer. Um, I was teaching the sciences in Rwanda during that period of time, um, but uh, but had the good fortune to to explore a lot of the the, the natural areas of the continent. So uh, so during that period of time, I, I I spent 60 nights under the stars uh, in in East African parks, and and that was kind of my introduction to wildlife conservation on the continent. Um, I was suddenly and completely hooked at the end of it, and. Uh, and fortunately, I've been able to devote the rest of my life to this kind of thing. Yeah, I could see how you can get hooked. Um, you know, I've spent only a few nights in Africa. We've done a South Africa safari, um, but we're planning one to go to, uh, you know, Rwanda upcoming. So that's, yeah, I could totally see how someone could get hooked on that. Um, so you recently changed career paths from science and education to kind of field conservation. Uh, what, what made you change this path? Well, I think it was the opportunity. Um, I, I, I was a Peace Corps volunteer in, 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 in Africa for a period of time. And, and then the opportunity to, to, to go to Rwanda and, and do research with, uh, with Diane Fossey presented itself. And, and, and of course, that was, uh, that was the dream come true. Uh, being able to, to go to Rwanda and spend time in the field with, with mountain gorillas is, is a dream. And, uh, and I had the good fortune to be able to do so. And, and so during that period of time, I, I became interested in, in the world of wildlife conservation writ large. Um, obviously, I, I had bunches of takeaways, you know, relative to my experiences in Rwanda with Diane. Uh, but later on in my career, I, I directed the Mountain Gorilla Project. And it was during that period of time um, that, uh, that I became interested in, in, in conservation um, on a broader perspective, and uh, it's during that period of time that I, I got involved in guerrilla tourism and uh, and became focused to a degree on on the whole idea of natural history travel and its importance as it relates to conservation efforts. Yeah, wow. Yeah, um, you, you just mentioned Diane Fossey. What was um, you know she was an absolute pioneer in uh, guerrilla conservation. Um, you know, arguably wouldn't even be uh, a, really a thing without her. Uh, what was your professional uh, and personal relationship with her like? Well, I agree that, that Diane is a, a very, very important player as far as mountain gorilla conservation is concerned. She brought the plight of mountain gorilla to world attention. Uh, the uh, National Geographic documentaries and the National Geographic magazine, that's how I was initially introduced to her, and I had the good fortune to work with her. I, I went to Rwanda. Uh, to the Karasoki Research Center at Diane's invitation and, and uh, worked as a researcher, um, did a combination of behavioral research, but also did a bunch of anti-poaching work during that period of time. Hmm. Uh, poaching was, uh, was rampant uh, in the late 1970s and early 1980s as a result of a variety of, of NGO efforts that has changed dramatically, but at the time it needed to be a real focus. And, uh, and Diane uh, basically orchestrated uh, that out of the Karasuki Research Center. Later on, it became the, uh, the fundamental tour of the Rwandan National Park System. But initially, it was Diane who was conducting that. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, yeah, so she was definitely on the forefront. And you were, um, yeah, you were right there with her. 
That's uh, I, I and I also read in doing some research. I read one thing that um, you guys might have differed on in just in terms of opinion was um, ecotourism. Um, is that true? Uh, and uh, you know, if so, what you know, if someone was looking to go and see these mountain gorillas, uh, what would you, um, you know, what advice would you have to give them to find a great outfit to go touring with, and then to uh, you know, in terms of location and timing. Well, certainly Diane and I did differ as far as um, ecotourism and its uh, fundamental um, approach uh, as it related to conservation. I, I had the good fortune to, to, to be at Karasoki when the African Wildlife Foundation, an innovator in this field, um, had a discussion with Diane and they talked about uh, this integrated approach of conservation that included um, guerrilla trekking and Diane wanted to have nothing to do with it. She, she basically mm. said, get the hell off my mountain. And, uh, and AWF uh, went off the mountain, but they had the, the, uh, the, the good sense to basically go to the Rwandan National Park System and, and have a similar conversation. And hence the Mountain Gorilla Project was born. Hence this whole idea of Mountain Gorilla trekking was born and, um, and it became a major part of the tourism industry in Rwanda. And personally, given my uh, experience with mountain gorillas and conservation, in particular in that part of Africa, I, I think it has played um, an extraordinarily important role, a critical role, in, in terms of um, uh, the success of mountain gorilla conservation. Uh, mountain gorillas are the only great ape in the world whose population is actually increasing. All other great apes in Africa and elsewhere um, populations are decreasing, and and I think um, one can attribute that to uh, to the the conservation program model that was established in Rwanda, and um, a lot of that is a result of uh, the gorilla tourism industry that uh, that not only supports conservation but plays a really really important role in terms of the economy of Rwanda and improving the livelihoods of the people who live with, I mean, effectively gorillas in their backyard. Absolutely, yeah. Do do you see that trend um, continuing of the uh, you know the population increase? Is that something that that you know you think will be sustained? Well, I I'm, I'm actually um, as a as a staff member of, of African Wildlife Foundation having those conversations with the Rwandan government uh, right. Um, right now. I, I've been in and out of Rwanda over the course of the last six months and, and happy to say that, that because of the growing gorilla population, um, the Rwandan government is concerned about the carrying capacity of Volcanoes National Park in Rwanda. And, um, and consequently, AWF earlier this year in January was able to purchase a piece of property immediately adjacent to Volcanoes National Park. We negotiated with the Rwandan government. Um, they basically accepted the, the donation of this land, and, um, and hence the, the park boundaries have been expanded. Uh, that wow. established a precedent for, uh, for a much larger conversation. And so over the course of the next seven years, there's a plan to relatively greatly expand the boundaries of Volcanoes National Park and also create a plan of livelihood improvement for people who live in the area, all related to gorilla tourism. So it's a, a pretty creative plan, but I, I think it, it gives you some idea as to uh, the way that the Rwandan government is presently thinking about mountain gorillas as a really, really important asset, um, one that is important from a natural history and uh, an environmental standpoint, but one that directly relates to uh, the, the the future of the country in terms of people and wildlife and and yeah we are the African Wildlife Foundation but but interestingly a large percentage of our work is actually focused on community development and and livelihood improvement and and if any conservation NGO these days believes that it's all about wildlife in terms of conservation efforts in my opinion they're not going to be successful you've got to integrate the two. And, and that's the way that you're ultimately going to be successful. AWF has been a real innovator in that particular field. Um, one example is Savino Silverback Lodge, uh, a very, very high-end facility in Rwanda that we helped develop uh, over the course of, uh, well, a number of years. It's, it's been operational now for the last 10 years. 
I think what's unique about the lodge is that, of course, it's directly related to guerrilla tourism, but the lodge, a very high-end facility, is owned by the local community, and therefore the local community benefits from profits that are made. Um, just a, a month ago, I was in Rwanda celebrating the 10-year anniversary of Sabino Silverback Lodge. There were thousands of community members lining the hillside, and everybody was celebrating its success. Uh, bottom line, from, from an economic standpoint, that community has netted about $3.5 million wow. over the course of the last 10 years. And if you look at it from an environmental or conservation standpoint, the gorilla population in that area is, um, is growing. And I, I think the community um, has effectively become conservation converts. They, they, they recognize that their life and, and, and their future is in one way, shape, or form directly related to the success of mountain gorillas. And so it's a, a cool story in that regard, and I think it's applicable to how one thinks about conservation throughout the continent in the future. That's incredible. That's great uh, to hear that you know, it's made such a difference. Um, this is for mountain gorillas. What, you know, there, there's mountain gorillas, there's eastern gorillas, and there's western gorillas. Um, do you see the same trends with Eastern and Western gorillas? You know, are they in peril or, or were they as much of a big, uh, you know, concern to begin with as mountain gorillas were? Well, if you take a look at the different species and or subspecies, I mean, there, there are big differences as far as numbers are concerned historically. Uh, but, um, as I just mentioned, um, the, the mountain gorilla, as a species, it is the only great ape in the world whose population is increasing. Right. If you take a look at the other species and subspecies of gorillas in Africa, unfortunately, the trend is not the same. Those populations are decreasing, and uh, I think some of that is related to political instability. Um, some of it is related to, to local custom. I mean, if you're talking about lowland gorillas, um, in that particular regard, unfortunately, populations who, who live in, in nearby situations, human populations who live in nearby situations, have a, a history of, of basically looking at, at gorilla meat as a delicacy. Right. So the bushmeat trade has a real impact in, in Central and West Africa, and uh, it's having a real deleterious effect on gorilla populations. Add to that disease like Ebola and uh, and many other diseases, and, and those populations, as mentioned, are decreasing, unlike mountain gorilla populations. Um, do I believe that some of the lessons that we've learned um, from mountain gorilla conservation might be applied to, uh, to the other great apes, bonobos and chimpanzees and lowland gorillas? Yeah, absolutely, positively. And we're trying to apply, African Wildlife Foundation is trying to apply some of that work in particular areas, um, in DRC with bonobos, um, in um, Senegal, and also Cameroon, uh, as it relates to chimp and lowland gorilla populations. And so I, I believe um, that, that there's reason to be optimistic, but, um, but one can't be complacent in terms of those great ape populations. Yeah, yeah, it's just the, you know, is are we able to take those learnings from that, that you and AWF have so diligently created and, and you know, uh, found, can we take those from mountain gorillas and plug them into other species? And yeah, it's, you know, it's, I'm sure it has a lot to do with the country, with a stability, um, with a location. Um, but, you know, you, you, it seems like you're on to something with these, with the ecotourism um, aspect. Well, I do believe I, I certainly do believe that, that a lot of the lessons that we've learned in Rwanda with mountain gorillas are transferable. And, 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 um, and so it, it, it actually has created the, the base for uh, a much larger initiative within the African Wildlife Foundation. We now have an African Ape Initiative, and, and so we're trying to apply many of those lessons um, that have been successfully implemented um, in Rwanda to other areas throughout the continent. And, and I am hopeful that um, that in many, many cases will continue to be successful. Yeah, I think so, too. Um, hey, I, so I saw a video uh, online as I was doing research for this, and it's just aptly titled Craig Shawley and the, the Silverback. Um, <laughs> and it, it looked, you might be familiar with this, but it looked as though, it, you know, this massive silverback, I don't know how big, but walks right by you. 
and it looks at though you know it looks right at you as though it was trying to make you submit or or to make you realize he was the alpha was that the case and if so like does that get frightening i mean that you know it seems to be a pretty uh pretty intense moment well i, I i'm a pretty lucky guy i've, I've had the uh, the opportunity to be in fields with gorillas for the last 40 years and so um i i think it's safe to say that i i do understand gorilla etiquette and uh, and and so that understanding allows me to, to to basically be in the midst of of these magical critters. And the video that you're referring to um, is just as you stated. A, a silverback comes walking towards me. I'm I'm kind of blocked by vegetation. There's nowhere for me to go. Um, I I think he was looking for me to submit, and and so I used a variety of vocalizations, self folk belt vocalizations and, and, and whimperings, if you will, and, um, and, and basically took a lower stance. And, uh, and, and ultimately, he came up right beside me, uh, took a look at me, recognized that I was paying allegiance of sorts, and, uh, and so all was cool, and he just moved on. Um, but it's a, a very, very special feeling. It's, it's a very special sensation to, to, to be that close to such a, a big, powerful animal and... Uh, and, and basically um, allow him or, or create a situation wherein his tolerance allows me to, <laughs> to continue to be alive. Again, it's important to recognize that, that one doesn't simply go out into the midst of a group of wild gorillas. Uh, the, the, the trekking experience that, that, that people have the good fortune to experience um, is based on years and years of prior work by, by people who actually created a situation wherein the, the gorillas are comfortable with humans in their presence. Um, the guides, of course, who take you out um, understand the gorilla etiquette also, and, and they apply that gorilla etiquette. And, uh, and if you follow the, uh, the, the, the directions of the guide, then you too can have that special experience of, of being in the midst of a family of gorillas. So I've heard you say that gorillas share 98.6% uh, of their genes with humans. What in your mind is the most human-like characteristic that, that gorillas have? Ooh, there are lots. <laughs> I, I mean, I take people into the field and, and, and it's really an, an emotional experience to, to, to be in, in the, uh, the presence of a gorilla family. And, you know, I always tell everybody, and I believe that they experience this very, very quickly. You, you see... Well, you look into the eyes of a gorilla and you see an awful lot of you looking back. And, and so, you know, morphologically, there are, are lots of, of, of similarities in, in, in terms of eyes and nose and hands and they, the way that they use all of these features. But I, I think as importantly, it's just the social dynamic. Uh, mm -hmm. Gorillas are extraordinarily social animals. And, uh, and as a result, uh, a lot of the interactions between mothers and infants and, and females and females and females and males, they're, they're comparable to what you see in human society. Wow. And that's, that's what creates an affinity between us and them. I can imagine. So the Trump administration has been, you know, notoriously pretty heartless about the environment, um, but seems to have targeted a lot of your, um, you know, a lot of what you work in directly. Uh, from taking a million dollars in funding from the African Elephant Conservation Fund to really kind of pulling out some important features in the you know Endangered Species Act, um, how much do, do this does this administration's policies affect you and your work? I I, I think the impact is, is is great on a whole variety of different levels. Uh, mm. You know, from a funding and from a policy standpoint. Uh, I mean, we, we see it happening in the United States uh, and, and the impact of, of this administration on environmental issues on our national park system right. um, is meant at this particular point. And, and, and so there, there certainly is spillover in terms of what we're trying to do in Africa uh, as it relates to uh, uh, funding that we previously had received from USAID. Um, and um, as it relates to, to, to policy and, and whether or not there can be the import of endangered species products like elephant tusks um, into the United States. Um, um, immense impact in, in a very, very negative way. Um, 
so how can someone help uh you know uh, uh, mountain gorillas or any of the species in Africa without, you know, if they're unable to make it there to, uh, for ecotourism, or if they're just, uh, you know, don't have the means, how can someone help um, your efforts with AWF? Well, I think it's important to, to become familiar with the issues. Um, and, um, you know, a lot of the, the issues that one deals with relative to specific species are transferable to other species. Um, you know, above and beyond that, I, I think it's really, really important to uh, to, um, to to get engaged. And and there are a myriad of wildlife conservation organizations out there. Um, do some research on um, on the the species and or the issues that are most important to you, and and then make sure that that if you're going to get philanthropically involved, um, you um, you donate to the the right organization wherein the bang for your buck is is going to have the most impact mm. and uh you know i you know obviously i i'm very partial to african wildlife foundation at this particular point i've i've devoted a large part of my career to this organization um but if you take a look at how we're evaluated uh from a charity navigator standpoint how we utilize our funds over over the last 60 years we we come out looking very, very impressively. And, right. and, and so I would use those tools uh, to gauge um, where you basically point your interest and, and how you uh, basically apply your philanthropic dollars. Well, Craig, I, I want to thank you so much for your time. Uh, there's a quote I love. It's called, it just goes, pursue something so important that even if you fail, the world is better off with you having tried. Uh, I think that's applicable here, except for your, your guys are succeeding so tremendously. Um, I, you know, we owe you big in terms of, uh, you know, the future of mountain gorillas. And yeah, I think you're one of the most inspirational figures in uh, conservation. So I really appreciate this time. Uh, you could have, you know, you set aside to talk with me. Well, thanks, Brian. Um, again, I'm a very, very lucky guy. And, <laughs> and I think, you know, the quote that you utilize is very, very important. It's, in the end, it's really, really important to be passionate about something and, and use that passion uh, to try to do good, and and hopefully um, a little bit of what I've devoted my life uh, basically falls into that category. So, you know, thanks for the interview. Of course. Thank you very much for your time, Craig, and um, I look forward to talking to you again hopefully soon. Okay. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining. If you liked that episode, feel free to rate, view, and subscribe. That actually really helps. If you haven't seen it yet, take a look at the accompanying blog. Don't forget your boots.com, where you can read more and see photos for all the interviews. Until next time, take care.